Perfect. Um, once again, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, after talking to Dom, we'll do the same thing in regards to the questions that we've done the last few webinars. Um, please use the chat box on the left hand side of your screen. Um, if you'd rather speak your question, please just press the raise your hand icon, which is beside the show conversation um, icon. If you put your mouse over your screen, and when there's a break in Dom's presentation, um, I will just get you to ask the question. So now I'll introduce you um, to the man who will be delivering tonight's webinar. He is currently the assistant coach and skills coach of the AHL Stockton Heat, Dominic Pittis. Well, thanks, Matt. Um, you know, so uh, guys, I've uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. First of all being stuck here as I'm sure you guys are in the, you know, the shelter in place. Um, you know, it seems a little bit like Groundhog Day. So uh, uh, thanks Matt for reaching out and um, wanting me to present today. So uh, today or tonight rather, what I talk about uh, is um, basically what skills AHL players need. And to be honest with you, I could have put, um, you know, what uh, junior players need or what youth hockey players need. Cause I really do think it's, it applies across this, uh, you know, for every age group. I have three kids, um, ages uh, 10, 12, and 13 that all play, and and this, you know, definitely applies to them. So, um, but to start with, it will be a little bit directed on how we define success. So initially, um, you know, how do we how do we determine basically what we need guys to work on? So to define success at the pro level. Uh, you know, obviously at the NHL level, we're, we're getting these guys to try to be able to play at the next level. Obviously, we define it by, you know, be able to win games or not. Obviously, the Stanley Cup is, um, you know, what they want to try to try to accomplish. And so, you know, you've got to win X amount of games. Then it comes down to obviously winning, winning those games. You got to score more goals and get than the other one. That's pretty, pretty standard, pretty straightforward or obvious. And but then ultimately is that we break that down into chances. So chances for chances against what that looks like. Um, and it's not an end all be all, but for us, we, we definitely uh, correlate chances for, if we can get more chances for than the other team more, more often than not, you're going to have, you're going to have success. And now, Hey, there's going to be times where we out chance the team and, you know, we get, we get beat five one, but um, for the most part, that's, that's the metric that we use uh, to determine, you know, kind of our success or the player's success and what we need to work on. So uh, what's the scoring chance? Again, um, this is what the Calgary Flames use, what our organization uses, uh, you know, a shot inside the house. You can see that kind of shaded area there. Um, and, you know, if it's a shot within there and it would be considered a bad goal, then, you know, that's not included. Now, you know, we, we've had, you know, conversations, you know, debating whether or not shots just outside of that or, and I, hey, trust me, we've, we've all had those conversations, but just for the benefit of consistency and, um, you know, they have an the analytics department, which basically judges players, you know, throughout the American League and the NHL, this is the, the kind of the standard to set. So this is, this is our, you know, how we judge um, a chance. So um, now, uh, and I should also mention, so basically a chance, there's a primary, a primary, like if we were to get a, a shot from within the house. So obviously the guy that takes a shot is get the primary. And then there's a couple, we use two helpers, two chance helpers, as far as um, to determine, you know, who, who contributed to it. And then on the other side, it's the same thing. If you, if you are, you know, primary responsible, there's one primary chance against, and then chance against helpers. So there's two of those. And then you get, you know, a plus minus at the end of the, at the end of a game or the end of a season, you get a plus minus score. Um, so that's basically how we how we uh, add tally those up. So skills that uh, to be able to create or defend. So again, you know, I could have added uh, I could have added shooting, I guess, on the plus side, but basically breaking them breaking them down. Just you know, big big box. You know, skating. You can probably all think of, the, of some of the skills on the offensive side, being able to escape, being you know, overspeed, different types of skating skills that would fall into that category. Um, puck protection. Again, there's you know subcategories of all these passing on the defensive side, being able to you know 
be responsible on the ice. You know, you're again, you're skating, transition skating, being able to stay on top of your check, your defensive detail when it comes into whether it's, you know, uh, stick on puck or baby hips in front of glove, well, whatever those details would be are the angling, you know, those, these are the, the different skills that will help you either create chances or be able to defend against. Um, and if I break it down that much further into puck protection, you can see, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of these will, uh, you can think of some different, different, some different categories or some different things, but like, for instance, deception is a, is a part of puck protection, which is cr creating separation. So whether you're deceptive with your stick, with your body or with your feet, um, your speed is a factor, your speed of your hands, your speed of your feet, strength, mobility. And again, you can kind of see, um, and these are all important factors in, in regards to the puck protection piece. Um, but there's one, one, one uh, element, and that's kind of one of the elements that I want to talk to, that basically if you don't have this one element, none of the, all of these matters, and that's awareness. If you don't have an awareness when um, you should use the deception, or if you don't have an awareness when um, you should use an overspeed or we should switch, should switch gears, then none of it's really going to matter, in my opinion. So um, that to me, if you if would probably, you know, obviously if you go back to this slide here, awareness falls into all these different categories. So, um, you know, that's something we want to talk about. So, um, Arsene Wenger, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this guy or not. He was a, a uh, pretty successful coach in the English Premier League um, for Arsenal. Um, very, in, you know, intelligent, intuitive guy. Uh, and I had watched a seminar from some analytics MIT conference that he spoke at. And he says, the problem in football is that you learn how to play the wrong way around. First execution, then decision making and perception last. And I would, I would agree with this because I, I find a lot of times you'll, you know, especially when you're teaching young kids and I dealt with it with my kids is that you'll teach them the skill and you're trying to get them to, to do it perfect instead of trying to teach them the kind of that, the situation as to how, and it takes them a long time. And I, I find you're like, you're teaching them in a vacuum. And I find like we get to our level and there's guys that are still be able to do those skills in a vacuum. And it's really, really difficult at that point to try to get them now to see, and they can, and if you have them do the individual skill, whatever, whatever it is, a crossover acceleration, or if it's a tight turn, or if it's a, whatever it is, they can do it to perfection, but to know when that they have to able to do it and when when they can and what they're looking for, that, that that's a struggle. Um, he w goes on to say here, uh, and now we're talking about scanning, obviously awareness. The better players scan the field six to eight times more than the other players. So he had uh, they had a they did a study. They had cameras set up around the training pitch. And basically what they determined is that the players who were successful were the ones that basically knew their environment better, right? So yeah, scanning and, and, and looking around. So um, I, I think that's critically uh, important. So my next clip here is just basically an example of that. Again, the, the, the video starts uh, fuzzy to begin with, but basically Frank Lampard, he was a world-class player, played in England, played for Chelsea, he's now a coach. But um, as you can see, Right, and the video kind of focuses up. You can see how how active he is, looking around, being able to see exactly where is what his surroundings are. So then he's able to make a play. And so, um, funny story a little bit. So we we brought this this uh, this you know not so much of a tactic because guys guys will do it, but we brought attention to it. Um, you know, and guys were uh, you know had a little bit of fun with it, and they were kind of mocking you know, how many times he's looking around. And it's one thing to look, but what are we looking for, right? Like that's that's the key. It's one thing to move your head around, but it's the other thing to take in that information to be able to say, okay, I'm going to put my myself in body position. So what exactly are we looking for? One of the things, obviously, is is time. And so I've got some some clips here just showing that. So this is Calgary and White here. Um, you've got to chuck behind the net. This puck comes around. And just his overall awareness of his time here, he realizes that those D are going to hold off on either post, right? And he's able to, to, to see the time that he has, 
and able to make the play out of it, and then the puck comes back down to the net. Another element of that you're looking for, you're looking for space. Now, you know, time and space, they kind of go together. You've got the the highlighted player there, Dylan Dubé, coming into the zone, right? He's shoulder checking, looking to see where, you know, time and space, this puck's going to pop out to him. Again, he's looking, does a great job, okay? But now his inability to really recognize what the situation is. So Dylan Dubé is world-class player, uh, world junior, uh, and, and is going to be a really, really good player, but has probably gotten away with being having the ability to skate himself out of trouble or skate himself um, you know, into situations just by sure speed or um, technique. And you can see in this scenario, so 49, I think that's Gerard, is just able to kind of take back ice, right? Puts himself in a situation where it went from being potential odd man rush to now he's painted himself into a corner and Gerard doesn't even have to put a body on him. He just sticks it off. So right back to his recognition of, of space, right? Recognize what he has and to be able to adapt to that. Another example here of space okay so this puck's gonna is gonna come around all right you got to chuck there again he's gonna look for options he's gonna be aware of his surroundings good play into the middle and now Lindholm 28 with a puck now it's kind of a similar situation right he sees where the space is it's a one on two right but what the difference is is that now he's able to put this puck into an area he's able to have a real he had realization of where his teammates were right and where the where the space was, these two D came over, and now instead of being in a situation where he's given up the puck, now he's able to put it in. Like those aren't those aren't skills, right? Like those are. I mean, there's obviously some technical skills, but for the most part, it's his awareness that enables him to be able to make those plays, right? Able to get on pucks. Okay, another scenario. Okay, this is Gerard here in front of the net. Again, talking about space right realizes comes in and just that just that little bit of awareness of where to chuck is he's able to protect it protect it and then now he's able to find and be able to come out and again all that comes into awareness okay um time space obviously teammates plays a role right little kick out to or shout out to uh last dance i'm sure a lot of us have watched it um but again talking about your awareness of your teammates. You were looking for time, we're looking for space. Obviously teammates is another one. Okay, again, TJ, oh. TJ Brody going back, looking looking over his shoulder. He sees to Chuck here in the middle. Okay, where's his team again to Chuck, right? Probably, probably if there's a little more awareness, probably can make this, probably can make this pass, right? Probably can make this pass, pass through. Right. Again, checking for the D, does a good job, but now just that continual awareness, right? Gerard here does a great job, right? D's, D are tricky this way sometimes. So they'll wait till right after you look, and then they're going to come. Doesn't realize that this guy does a good job coming in on the four check and forces them to put it on the wall, but now it turns over for a chance against her Calgary just because – there's just a little bit of lack of awareness from all the kind of the parties involved, just where their teammates are. Uh, last one here is the opposition, right? Time, space, teammates. And then the last one here is the opposition. Johnny Goudreau here does, and again, I'll rewind this here, and there's some different views. Looks, It looks pretty simple at what he does. I mean, he looks at it always fast, but if we look at it closely, right, Johnny's looking to see Gerard's feet before he throws it back. It's not a complicated play. He's not saucing the puck into some area. He's forcing him to commit one side. And you can see that he now puts it back into space. And now there's a chance. Monahan gets it. Monahan, sorry, gets a chance. But you can see, I'll play this in slow motion. He's able to, to recognize when he's committed. And then he starts to put the puck back into that area. Now, this play happens in an instance. And, you know, uh, Goudreau has obviously had, you know, multiple repetitions and been able to recognize when the D is committed. But again, it's not a complicated play. But if he doesn't have this awareness of the opposition, of the opposition skate, of his stick, he's not able to make this play. But then again, 
right? He's able to make it, make it and uh, makes a great play going through. Okay, another example here. You've got three avalanche attackers. I think it's Landis God coming through, coming to the line. And now I know that, um, you know, the uh, Power Edge Pro is a really popular product. And I, and I, my personal <clears throat> thought is there's, there is, there is a lot of good to it. Um, but the one thing I think that it, it restricts and lacks is that if I back this up, you can see Brody is, he's moving as he comes back with the powers, bro. It's in place. So what we try to do as a coaching staff is try to kind of have a, a moving power edge pro, if you will, and to be able to replicate those angles and to have those players place pucks into, into space. Because as you can see, Landis Gog, he's just waiting for this stick, right? He's waiting for the stick to be able to make the D move. McKinnon, the same thing. He has the awareness. He knows Giordano. Get my cursor. He knows Giordano here is going to strike, so he makes a quick play to get it over to the other side, right? And it, and it turns into a rush. Another chant, another view of it here. Again, this isn't a complicated play. You could get mites, or I guess they call them Adam, or um, in the states they're called mites here. But you can get those guys to make a play sliding it underneath. That's not a complicated skill. The complicated skill is figuring out when this D is going to strike. Right. So as the peewee player that's coming up the ice or the Bantam player, his the recognition, it comes in. It's not the skill of slipping it underneath. They can do that. They could probably do that right from initiation. But what the what they need to recognize and, and start seeing is, is, is the D coming? Right. I've got to push this puck. I've got to speed up or I've got to slow down to be able to get it underneath the stick and be able to go through. And that, that to me is the fundamental skill of, of, of why. Right. So as you can see. These are important skills. These are all these are all factors in have in in learning this skill, but the awareness piece is absolutely crucial when it comes when it comes to that. Um, Matt, did you want to open it? Was there any questions at this point? Uh, not so far. No. Okay. Right, so talking about what we're looking for, as I say, they kind of I could make the argument with those last clips that time and space and teammates and opposition they kind of overlap or they overlap there but again when we're looking and we're scanning these are these are the things that we're looking for so how do we improve this this awareness piece right this is this is this is kind of the question and um you know at, at the end of this i'd like to hear your guys thoughts because these these are just my my thoughts and how we can improve it so first and foremost and i really won't get into this um there's a there's being in the bay area here this guy here um, is gets a lot of air time and a lot of the things that he does is as far as his vision. Um, some of you guys might already do it with your, with your clients or your teams, uh, just improving your peripheral vision, improving like these glasses that he has on. We have our goalies wear them and they shutter them off and they open them up and everything is just improving that physical ability. Um, you know, your mobility, you know, those are all physical things I think that you can improve on. That's one way of doing it. I'm not going to, as I say, I'm not going to touch on that too much. Um, but adapting to your environment, um, and putting guys into situations, I think is, uh, another way to improve this awareness. So I've, and again, another soccer reference. So this is, this guy's name is Pep Guardiola. And he's a super successful coach, maybe one of the best in the world. Um, he coached a team in Barcelona and won multi every championship that you could possibly imagine. And then he moved to Bayern Munich and um, he's at Manchester City, again, winning multiple championships. But the basis of his practice is basically around, um, it's called Rondo. And it basically, it's like like pig in the middle for for a lack of a better, of a better term. And so here's it. Here's an example, just a still of an example of basically you got a guy in the middle and the players are, are passing around on the outside. But and again, he'll change. He'll change it a little bit. And I'll, and I'll show an example here. So here's here's an example uh, of one of the ways that they do it. So there's two players in the middle and then the players on the outside have got to be one touch on the outside. So again, you can see the level of skill, obviously, that these guys can move it around and the deception and, and the, the way, you know, that you, that you think. But as I say, he has basically um, just these different variations of this game. And there's, a, there's another variation that he has 
where there's a grid and you'll have um, players that are like uh, neutral players. And then you'll have one team in the middle of the grid on defense. And then on the outside of the grid will be on offense. And they'll try again, they'll try to move it around and they he'll change the constraints, whether it's one touch or two touch or whatever it is. And then on transition, the grid players go to the outside and the other one's coming in. We've tried different different uh, scenario or different alterations of that in, in hockey and still still trying to get there. One of the we've tried this, we work, we work on this one. Uh, I run the power play in Stockton. And we've tried a bunch of different ways. And, and I'll be honest with you, and it's been five years. And um, depending on the head coach, uh, how much time I get with it. Uh, the nice thing about uh, the last couple of years that I've had, we've been, we've been able to do this before practice at least a couple times a week. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll show some of the clips. So this, the constraint I put on this one was that it had to be two touch and that it had to be, I believe it had to be a one-timer pass. So you can say you can see at the start of this, it's a little bit deliberate, right? You can see some of the guys that are power play guys and some guys that are not. And again, once once it gets going here, you can see some of the some of the sequences that you that kind of make sense, right? Again, two touches, that was about 12. But again, I think that these types of games and are so crucially important when it comes to building these players' awareness, right? Um, again, you can you can put them in different different parts of the zone. Um, you know, I, I think again, I'll fast forward. I'll fast forward this part of it again. Um, there's a pretty good sequence here where they start to tick it around. Okay, you guys get the idea. So. Here's a, let me get the volume here because this is annoying. Um, so here's a game and this, this is the power play. And hey, I, I want to preface all this by saying these guys are really good players. And there's no, by no means that the drill is the reason why they did it. But I think like players need to, need to have that ability in practice to be able to make those small little plays, those small little touches, those small one touch. And you can see in this scenario here, they get into trouble and they're able to touch, 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 gets to the far side, puck goes through. And then again, same kind of idea. And a lot of, a lot of these, a lot of these plays, you could argue they've done them before. Right. And again, the, the, the part that it's not structured uh, in the way some of the constraints are, and you can play with them. I think that is so important for them to be able to to get confident in making those those little adjustments. Um, a book that kind of came to mind and that's kind of shaped the way that I, the information that I give um, to players is the inner game of tennis. And now I I heard I think it was Tom Brady and there was uh, uh, Steve Kerr that had mentioned it, and basically it's about the psychology of the game. And talking about how complex um, the the human body is, and that a lot of times, if we're thinking, okay, um, you know, I got to keep my left elbow up to be able to, you know, to, to for a puck protect or to to you know to shoot more correctly, or is basically we're limiting the complex you know physiological body that we have and everything that it can do. And I think a lot of times as coaches, and I did this a ton. I, you know, I catch myself still a little bit is that you try to give one technique that, that you feel like is going to happen as opposed to try to get a, try to giving a result that, that the player has to figure out, like they have to kind of figure out based, based on, um, you know, whether the, you know, your puck, the pucks are, if you're teaching someone how to pass, the puck is wobbly. Okay. We need a flat puck when we're making the pass as opposed to, okay, put her head down or, you know, roll it from heel to toe, you know, as opposed to, Hey, the pucks need to be flat, figure out how that puck needs to get flat. And they'll, you know, they'll be able to feel it, figure it out with a touch. So, um, you know, the one quote here, the arrow is off the string, but does not fly straight to the target, nor does the target stand where it is calculation, which is miscalculation sets in. So for me, this, this resonates with me. So basically, by the time you start to th to think about, I've got to do this, this, and this, the play's over. The play's done, right? And for kids, the game happens so fast. And um, I think that we lose sight a lot of times in trying to 
trying to give too much information. And I think the game teaches itself a, a lot when it comes it comes to this. And um, I use the example of learning to shoot the other way. So I have three daughters and they all play and two of them shoot right. I shot left. So for the for the life of me, I was trying to show them, you know, how to sh how to shoot. And I'm seeing them shoot and I'm like, no, that's not it. And I'm hey, I'm watching. Uh, I'm giving them feedback, the feedback that I got. And what I found was, is that when I started to try to teach myself how to shoot the other way, the, the, the best way for me that I was able to make strides is by adjusting to what my results were. So as I shot or as I passed, right? Cause at first I'd be like, okay, make sure it's on, on the heel. My feel wasn't, my touch wasn't the same. And so for me to be able to get that touch, but head up, but for me to have, like I talked about, that awareness initially of where I was passing, that made so much more of a difference than trying to, as I say, okay, now put your put your hands this far apart, right? Like that that just muddied the waters and and uh, really limited, um, you know, all the all the you know the tools that my body had that so that are so complicated that are so tough to to be able to explain. So letting letting the players. Um, being able to, uh, you know, figure that out for themselves and, and let their athleticism and skill take over. The third thing in as far as um, being able to improve awareness is I think the habits of your of your daily of your daily practice. And I have a picture up here of um, probably one of the most um, consistent performers that um, that that I've played, are coached. Um, again, I was this there shortly in a in a in a um, you know just starting coaching, but just to see just the way every day um, he was consistent with his with his habits, with whether it was going back for pucks, ch shoulder checks, uh, whether it was shots from the blue line, whatever it was, there was maximal intent, and, it, and his habits in the practice were the habits in the game, and I think that. Um, you know, that really resonated and you could really make the argument that he's still getting better. He, win, he wins a Norris at 36, 37 years old. There's a reason for it. And it's not just um, for sure. It's just not coincidence that, 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 that that's the case. So I'm going to show just a couple different habits um, of some of our players. And again, here's, here's from our practices and I'll, I'll try to run through these and they're slight. Um, but I, I think, uh, you, you'll see that, you know, ultimately the, they will make the difference. So here's one player, here's the D, the D is going to go back and retrieve this puck and he's just going to hit uh, a couple wingers coming through. So you can see the D goes by just a little dust. And again, it's not a, it's not a big thing, but he goes back, touches it a couple times, moves it up. Now you can see, so that was a, that was a player actually just out of junior. And this is a player here who spent time in the NHL and you can just see it's a subtle difference, but it makes a, it makes a massive difference. So you can see he goes back. So now he's shoulder checking. Now we know what the drill is, right? There's nobody coming from this side of the ice and I'm not sure if you saw it, but he, he shoulder checks to this side of the ice. And again, it's just, just a habit. He goes back for it, no dust, and he's able to move it right away. So again, a small detail, but, something that is not complicated, but it just enables him to increase his time, his space, being able to get his head up, just enables to simplify the game. Okay, another, another retrieval from a D. So this D gets it, okay, slow to the forehand, moves it, okay. Doesn't seem, doesn't seem like a big detail, but now the, the veteran guy goes back, grabs it, again, shoulder check, gets around it quick, and makes that pass. Now it's, as I say, it's subtle, but what it does is it basically, it's the habit of going back, getting it quick to your forehand. So then now, yeah, the, now he can make this pass quickly. This guy gets the puck in plenty of time. It's not a suicide pass, right? As opposed on the other example, he was outside on the wall. And if he had to make a play other than into the middle, he wouldn't have been able to, he was limited. Okay, some some detail shooting from the blue line again. Veteran guy gets it, no dust, back. Okay, same veteran guy, puck comes in, no dust. Right, 
And again, that seems like a small detail, but now I'll watch the guy that just got called up from the East Coast League. Gets it. Stick handle, right? And that might not seem like a big detail, but in a game, that's the difference between that puck getting through and that puck getting to the net. That's the difference between that guy being able to make a pass to the back door that suddenly opens or just to be able just to chuck it around. So these small, these small details, um, you know, help the players to give them more time and space, right? If it's a Bantam player that's receiving that puck at the blue line, he's able to get that puck back there and be able to keep, keep that puck in his forehand. And now he can be able to, to make the next play. Okay. On the forward side of things, this is just a warm-up drill. So this player comes in. Okay. Does it look like he's trying to score? No. Okay. The other player comes in, right? I, you know, of those three, I, the three, the three of them are all good players. But the last player to shoot, who tried to change the sh shot angle. Probably, I think he scored 10 more goals than the other two guys. And there's a reason for it because it's the consistency and it's the habit every time he comes in. And again, it's a small detail, but it's an important one. Again, same player, leading goal scorer this year. Again, right? Just a little bit of a little bit of, of deception, right? Every time he came in and shot a puck, that was that was his his MO and, and what he was looking to do, right? So again, those habits are are so, so, so important. So again. What are the signs of a good pro or a career learner? So, and a good pro could be a good student. It could be anything. So you're consistent, right? And you have intent and, and obviously it makes you more efficient. So, um, you know, I think these are, you know, at our level, it, it, it basically is it's a pretty good indication whether the guy is going to, whether go on to have a career in hockey or, or be able to continue to play or is going to be, you know, two or three years and unable to kind of elevate his game and to, and to improve it. So, uh, Matt is now's a good time. Is there any questions with any of that? Um, I kind of have one. Is there any drills that you can do to help kids from Matt, dusting the puck? Like, is there anything that you can recommend, um, as a drill or something that, you know, can prevent kids from, from dusting? Okay. I'll continue on. Um, so being able, being, a, being able to make, um, uh, have the ability, the awareness, obviously a big P a big key. Um, but now it goes back into some of the, um, kind of the next, next level thing is that, can you make the next play? So whatever you're teaching, your whatever you're teaching, whether you're, we're teaching pros or juniors or um, a PB girls and whatever it is, is that do they have the foundations to be able to make the next play? If they're if you're teaching a cutback, um, is their body in a position where once they once they make the cutback, they're able to cut back? If if because they're now they're aware of their environment, are they able to make that next that back that next play? So I want you to to draw your attention. Uh, to the middle here, again, these these are are small details, but just the detail of just weight shift and just to be able to be over on that hip so that you're able to you're able to protect, right? You've got the puck, but you're also able. To, you're not leaning. You're not over top. You're just you're from the hip. So again, those those foundational foundational skills that are so important. Even our guys, I find guys they lean right. We'll do a cut back and they're. They're predictive, and if they have to make a cutback the other way, or they have to move with their upper body, they're unable to do it. So it's vitally important to work on those things. So one of the drills we've worked on, this is a little bit of a progression. So the the player is basically just going to come around this side here and shoot. Um, he's going to be moving his feet, and I want to have the puck on the outside because realistically, you're probably going to have a D here with a stick. Um, so as you can see, players coming around again, not great, right? Puck, puck is a, you're exposing the puck, being able to go through. Okay. Again, you can see some guys are better than others. Right. Again. Okay. 
Okay, second progression here. Right, just just the cutback. So what I'm looking for on the cutback is again, a lot of times I'll stand or I'll have somebody to stand on the inside. So as this player comes this way, and now they now they cut back, right? Protecting the puck. Now they come back the other way. They still have the puck in the out on on the outside as opposed to bringing it back here to the middle. You can see the players trying to keep it to the outside. And then the last progression here, you can see this player coming around the outside. And now this, I'll do it now to a whistle, to a reaction. So he's coming around the outside, right? <laughs> Dynamic little guy. And he's able to keep that puck on the outside. That's, that's what we're looking for. Now, you can see this player here now is exposing it to the, exposing it to the middle. Right, you've cut back. You're not going to expose that puck in the middle. And again, these are small details, foundation small small details, that will prevent you from being able to make make the next play. And that's what and that's that's the key is can you make the next play? Is it protected? Is it is it in a, a situation where you're in balance and you're athletic and you're not committing to the to the to the point where your only play is chipping it behind the net or your only play is being able to you're basically restricted to just the one play that you had in your mind to start with. So here's an example here. This player here, kind of what we're talking about, okay, cuts out. And then now we talked about being able to have the puck on the outside. He doesn't, he exposes it here into the middle, right? And now it, it basically restricts his ability to be able to make a play. If he has it on the outside, he can move it back to the outside, but this, lack in foundational awareness and again this is this is just a this is just awareness right this is just being able to be like okay i've got to now i've got to move my feet as opposed to just i'm going to go and i'm going to cut back and i'm going to see what happens right that that's holding them back to be able to to be able to be able to make plays okay wrong clip hey here's an example Again, Lindholm, uh, in my opinion, one of the better players uh, for Calgary. Again, similar scenario, right? Looking to make a shot, realizes that he's not able to make a shot, pucks on the outside, and then now he turns up, protects the puck, and now look at now he he can make the next play, and that's and that's one of the keys. So the awareness piece, and then the, the next one is, are you able to react to that environment? Right? Can you can you make the next one? Okay, and it ends up being a great chance for Calgary. Okay, so how can we help them? We talked about daily use, practice reminders. Okay, the other the other thing is to add the pressure. Right, add pressure um, in practice. This is a, this is an example of a drill. So this pass is going to be down. It's just a quick a quick two on one here to the net. Then they're going to neutral zone regroup, right? So now here's a, a coach. We're going to spot this puck here. So now coach is putting pressure on him, right? Coach is going to put pressure on him. He's got to go back to puck, right? Normally we'll take one side to the other. Player moves it up. And then now it's a two-on-one. But instead of just a clear-cut two-on-one where players will, will generally come and slow, coach is now going to pressure on the way back because – the difference of being under pressure to making this play on a two on one is significant, right? And in a game, you're under pressure, so you're trying to replicate that. Um, okay. Another another way is uh, having the players do it, replicating different different scenarios. Here's a little little quick little two on one where the player in the middle, right, under pressure, trying to make a, a little quick little quick play through traffic right putting it on their back and having, having to make those little plays and and making it competitive right. the other way that we we generally start practice we usually start and end practice the same way with a small area game and I find it gets the players um, involved. You saw the four-on-two power play um, practice. 
we'll start with a little little two on two or a regroup back with the coach. Um, and again, the the tendency now is to move everything into these competitive small little games. Um, is is uh, one it's has the players. Uh, you know, vested and, and, and engaged. Um, and we see the best results based from, from players being able to, to make these, all these, these multiple different reads that they have, they have to make. So here's this, this, the little two on one regroup back with the coach. And I'm sure you, you guys have, have, I've seen a bunch of different small, small games. And again, just, a, just a quick little warm up, um, get guys hands going and everything else. So, um, you know, and I've got some other, some other uh, drills and and different different types of things. But um, this is this is the one question that at the end of every practice, I, I think you owe um, yourself as a coach, and uh, you know you owe it to your players to ask you this: Did you hit the sweet spot? Right? Did they did did they want to have another rep? Were they being competitive? How was the intensity? And I I think um, and I know personally, I, I probably went through this. Is that initially you start to you start to blame the players. You're like, well, this guy doesn't listen. This, you know, this guy is, you know, is focused. That's not their job, to be honest with you. It's it's your job to be able to to keep them engaged, keep them focused. Um, and I I think that with this type of mindset, you'll really start to, to figure out what makes your players tick and you'll want and you'll want them because if you're getting if you're getting them to, to want another rep if you're getting them to, to be competitive and there's the intensity um you know it's it's such a joy it's such a joy to coach so um that's all i got here fellas um there's my email there uh if um uh, if anybody has any questions um, I can answer those now, and if if you don't think of some, and you ever want to send me um, some type of question, um, you know, feel free at that email there. Yeah, Lee Hamilton has one here. Yeah, Dom. I can't hear you, bud. You can't hear me. Hold on one sec here. Oh. Okay, there you go. Sorry, my. No problem. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Lee Hamilton just has a question. He says, what is something that is that us coaches of younger kids would work on more with these kids? Is there anything that you see that's constantly lacking at your level, skills, habits, et cetera? Yeah. I, I mean, as, as I say, um, it would be, if, if there was one, one particular thing, as I say, it would be that, it would be that awareness piece. It would be just, um, the, the why, right? Why are they, why are they cutting back? They're coming up the wall. Why are they cutting back? Are they cutting back because the D has position on them? Are they cutting back because, um, you know, they're getting closed off or the, they've got the puck in a bad position. Um, I think that that is, that is so important to get them to, to understand. And that's why the, the small area game. And again, there's so many different ways of going about that. Um, and you know, you can, even, a, even for the younger players, you can, you can restrict some of the defensive players by whether putting their stick upside down or taking their stick away or whatever it is. Um, I think there's always ways to be able to progress and regress the drills, but you need them to be able to, to, to be, um, the, reacting to something to an environment if they're doing passing um you know have them have them doing it for for time or for speed or they're against somebody else um because i i think uh you know that, that's that's so critically important not to just to be have them like i said just something in a vacuum to work on something in a vacuum to me there, there's it takes away from the for the in-game application Great. I got a quick question. I probably, yeah. I think I know the answer, but is there any drills that you can suggest um, for kids who dust the puck? Um, for, so they get it and they want to, they want to touch it a bunch. Just constantly dusting it. Yeah. Is there anything yeah. other than maybe applying some pressure? Is there anything else that you can maybe uh, suggest? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was, uh, you know, that was my first, uh, 
recommendation. I think you maybe restrict, like for instance, in the game that we had, the four on two game, you restrict the amount of touches that they can have. So you'll say, okay, you can you can touch it twice. So basically, they receive it once, and then they've got to they've got to move it, and then if they don't, the other team takes possession. So then it'll it'll start that kind of process, that mind pro- process of, okay, I'm getting it, and I've already got to look around, and I've already got to see what the next play I I, I have to make is. Um, you know, I, I think unless you rest, unless you restrict, you know, the player's possession, there's there's no there's no motivation for them not to move it, right? They'll be like, oh, I'm just going to hang on, I'm just going to hang on to this. But if the constraints of the game basically, uh, you know, prevent them from doing that, then they'll get in the habit of doing it, and then I think you can progress it from there. Perfect. There's a couple more here. Uh, Phil Roy is wondering, do you feel awareness is the key to improve hockey sense? Absolutely, I, without question. Without question, I think it's it's um, in essence. I think it is hockey sense, and and <laughs> trust me, I I was I think Matt and I talked about it. I had my uh, my older daughter, and she, you know, struggles with hockey sense at times, and I I believe it's 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 an awareness of her surrounding and being able to react to something as opposed to just okay, I'm going to go down the wall and I'm going to take turn right like the Dubé clip. Right. He's going down the wall and he's going to take turn and he didn't take into account any any of the information that was out before him. So I think the more that you can do that, um, you know, and you can control it, you know, as a as a coach, you can control that pressure and control that environment a little bit and then, you know, have them so they, you know, provide it for themselves. But I definitely think, um, you know, you can you can get them reacting to it and then ultimately, you know, that that you know, just fosters that, at that, that awareness. And then to me, hockey sense. Perfect. There's one more here. Uh, Taylor Fry is wondering how much do you utilize video when working on player skill development? Uh, quite a bit. Well, quite a bit. I, I think for the most part, I think when we look, um, when you look at the video, it will basically, I'm basically asking, well, what did you see? Right. What was the reason why you made this play? What was the reason why you made that play? And because I found instead of, you know, I'm not the one out there making the plays. They're the ones out there making the plays. So there's a reason why, why. And a lot of times, you know, they'll have to say, well, I saw this guy coming down and, and, and right. So it basically, you know, we talked about what they're looking for when they're scanning their time, space and everything else. And it basically gives them an extra bit of, uh, information to be able to see from a different perspective hey i had more time there i had more space i could have done this this is this is why i got the puck turned over i exposed it early so i definitely do use um video when it comes to that and um we were fortunate this year you saw in some of the clips we had those were goal pros we just had goal pros put up on either side and uh ran them and and so beneficial for me to be able to to look and even post practice because you miss a lot of things post practice um, to be able to go back and check and just to see, you know, how different players reacted to different things. So, Perfect. Uh, nothing more here in the chat. You guys have anything else for Dom? I guess if you guys don't, we will conclude his webinar. Uh, I'd just like to thanks, thank you to, uh, to Dom for doing this for us. It is greatly appreciated. Um, thank you to you guys for joining us. Um, you know, we've done, the, this is the third one that we've done. So um, I really hope you guys gained a little bit of extra knowledge or something that you can take back to your own teams or um, when you're working with your individual players. So. Again, just thank you, and and great. Thanks a lot, Dom. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Everybody stay safe.